On the 15th of October 1937, three customers of a cafe in a downriver suburb of Detroit, Michigan vanished. The curious case of the Melvindale trio went on to be one of the largest non-criminal manhunts in the state's history, and the fate of the missing remains a mystery. Melvindale is a city located in Wayne County of Michigan, USA. In the 1930s, the settlement known as the Little City with a Big Heart had a population of approximately 4,000. It was a Friday in mid-October of 1937 when a man and two women entered the Hollywood Cafe in Melvindale, which would be the last location they would be seen alive. They were Margaret Redden, aged 35, Artie Mabel, aged 42, and Thomas Lorimer, who was 24 years of age. Margaret Boyd Redden was raised in Buffalo, New York, and moved to Detroit in 1915 along with her parents. A decade later, she married James Redden in Detroit and she worked as a secretary at T.A. Bollinger Real Estate, which was a business situated immediately next to the Hollywood Cafe. The Reddens' marriage proved difficult and the couple, who never had any children, decided to go their separate ways. Arte Carson Maybe spent her early years living in the community of Clearwater, Idaho. In 1917, she wed Sylvester Maybe in Butte, Montana. The couple moved to a home in Detroit and then packed their bags for a fresh start in Melvindale in 1925. Artie was well acquainted with Margaret Redden, the latter having previously been employed to work for Sylvester Maybe as his secretary during a period of seven years between 1927 and 1934, when Sylvester was Melvindale's city clerk. Similarly with the Reddens, the Maybes did not have children. Thomas Murray McIntyre Lorimer was born on the 14th of February 1913 in the village of Hags near Falkirk, Scotland, to distillery worker James Henderson Lorimer and his wife Beatrice McIntyre. The pair had been married on the 12th of March 1908 in Kelvinside, Glasgow. The Lorimer family emigrated to Quebec, Canada in 1928 and Thomas married Evelyn Fleming in approximately 1934. Following the birth of their first child, the family moved to Melvindale in 1936. Along with his father and brother, Thomas worked at the American Malting Company in Detroit and was known to have bought a brand new 1937 Oldsmobile. It was through the purchase of his vehicle Thomas came to know Margaret Redden, as he made his payments for both his car and his rent to the same company she was employed at. The timeline of events recorded on the 14th and the early hours of the 15th of October 1937 goes as follows. Margaret of 723 Lansing, Detroit, and Artie of 17295 Palmer Street, Melvindale, arrived at the Hollywood Cafe at Dix and Oakwood. Artie's husband was away on a hunting trip for the weekend and wished to have a catch up with her friend, the pair sharing a table together. Thomas Lorimer of 17606 Flint Street, Melvindale, sat by the bar with a companion. At 1.50am, his friend departed from the cafe and Lorimer decided to join Redden and maybe with a beer in hand. The trio exited the coffee house at 2.20am, climbing into Lorimer's Oldsmobile, which at the time had only been in his possession for around five weeks. They drove off and returned to the cafe 40 minutes later, however it was Margaret Redden who was behind the wheel in the driver's seat. 
The vehicle was pulled over by local police officers Harry Bringleson and Leonard Anderson, who witnessed all three inside. The officers were familiar with them and believed that after pulling them over for hanging around the now closed cafe, nothing was wrong. During their chat with the police, Arte walked to her car, which was parked outside the cafe, to retrieve her hat. She jumped back in to the back seat of the car, stating to Redden in the front seat and Lorimer beside her in the front, let's go. Redden fired up the engine of the 37 Oldsmobile and they raced away into the foggy darkness, heading north of Dix on Oakwood towards Dearborn. The vehicle's Michigan license registration was confirmed as being 71-697. After a period of silence, authorities were notified by the families and friends of the missing, and around two days after vanishing, the hunt was on to find them. Diving further into details around the trio, it was plainly obvious that their disappearance was incredibly out of character. They lived fairly ordinary lives on a day-to-day basis and spent much of their leisure time at home, so the sudden departure without any notice raised red flags with those who knew them best. When they disappeared, between them they had very little cash and didn't take anything other than themselves and the clothes on their back with them. Artie's denture plate had been left at the dentist's office for repairs and her car was still parked outside of the cafe when police began their investigation. Lorimer had seen his new car as his pride and joy, not even allowing his closest family to drive it, so it struck as odd that he would let Margaret take the wheel. It was reported by the Detroit Free Press that Thomas was, according to the officers, intoxicated, which would be a good enough reason for him not to drive. Searches were carried throughout the local area and the state of Michigan. The Rouge River was also scoured by authorities, checking to find any trace of Thomas's vehicle, but the expansive search was unsuccessful. The shoreline of the Detroit River was explored and a helicopter conducted an aerial search of the river and lakes. However, once again, no clues were recovered in the 20 plus miles of water. Woodland around the area was scoured by over 50 volunteers and hounds, but nothing of any significance was found. Artie's husband, Sylvester Maybe, offered a $500 reward for any information leading to the safe return of his wife. However, the trail soon went cold. A source claimed at the time that Lorimer had crossed the border to California, but there was no record of this. Yet, it was entirely possible that he had entered the Golden State through Arizona, where the border is not sufficiently patrolled. Police investigated the Californian and Mexican borders, but their efforts were fruitless. It is popular among theorists that there are two scenarios which seemed most plausible in the case. The first suggests that the trio left of their own volition and had planned to vanish for reasons unknown and wanted to never be traced. Another idea is that they met with foul play and were subsequently disposed of, as well as the vehicle. During December of 1937, a private detective spoke to authorities, claiming that he had witnessed Thomas Lorimer and Artie Maybe sitting in his car in Duluth, Minnesota. Yet, once more, after another search, police hit a brick wall in terms of trying to crack the case. Although it is not 100% confirmed, there was a strong indication in various reports that the fathers of both Margaret Redden and Artie Maybe both mysteriously vanished, which is an odd twist in the tale. On the 1st of January 1938, three-year-old Shirley Ann Lorimer made a wish on her birthday that her father would one day return to her. However, sadly, this dream never became a reality. 
Police were actively attempting to dispel rumours of a triple murder which left many panicked by a potential killer on the loose. In the autumn of 1938, police travelled to Arkansas State Prison to interview inmate Joseph B. Anderson, known as Smokey Joe, who confessed to killing the trio. In March 1939, Anderson, who did not provide any leads on the case, was executed by the electric chair, and it was never confirmed if he had been telling the truth or whether he was just trying to get a last-minute stay of execution. Since 1937, articles have been written about the peculiar case of the missing Melvindale trio. However, even after more than 80 years, no fresh leads have come to light regarding the fates of Redden, Maybe, and Lorimer. Over the years, several motor vehicles have been recovered from the River Rouge, yet the 1937 Oldsmobile remains missing. Sylvester Maybe legally divorced his wife in 1942, the action granted due to the fact there was not a single clue as to her whereabouts or status. He did not remarry and passed away in 1955 following a long illness. Thomas Lorimer's mother and father relocated from Melvindale to California in 1941, living out their days with the burning hope that Thomas would one day be found. James died in 1959 and Beatrice died in 1966, the couple never knowing what happened to their son. Thomas's wife, Evelyn, left Melvindale with their daughter, Shirley, and she remarried in Oregon in 1943. Evelyn passed away in 1991, and Shirley, who was married in 1956 and mother to two children, died in 1967 at the age of 32. Interestingly, James Redden, Margaret's ex-husband, was arrested by police in November 1937 under suspicion of being the person responsible for the triple disappearance. He wasn't charged as there was no evidence to suggest his involvement, however he was re-arrested exactly a year on from his ex-wife's vanishing after a heated argument with a companion. James married for a second time in 1940 and after a court declared Margaret dead in absentia, inherited his first wife's estate, estimated to have been worth about $500 or around $9,000 in 2019. Following this payment, James Redden mysteriously disappeared from the record. Over the decades, the motive for the group's disappearance remains unclear and continues to puzzle investigators and more than 80 years have passed with no further clues emerging. Among professional investigators and amateur sleuths, the most likely theory is that they perished in the River Rouge, but of course the car and remains of the victims have yet to be recovered. If they were victims of a crime, what was the killer's motive? Did they dispose of the evidence? Was the perpetrator closer to home or a stranger? When they left the Hollywood cafe the first time, where did they travel to? Did they meet with someone? Had the trio arranged to begin life anew? Were they closer than just acquaintances? Chances are, unfortunately, it will never be known as to what happened on that chilly night in October 1937. Despite their immediate families having passed on, their descendants continue to seek answers and justice for their loved ones, Thomas Lorimer, Artie Maybe and Margaret Redden.